I want to go from Jacksonville to the 60th anniversary of the 63 March on Washington. People often don't realize its official title was the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. These were the words of the Reverend Martin Luther King 60 years ago today. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? That was Reverend Martin Luther King 60 years ago. Today. Well, on Saturday, thousands on Saturday, thousands gathered in Washington, D.C. to mark this 60th anniversary. Organizers included the Reverend Al Sharpton of the National Action Network. 60 years ago, Martin Luther King talked about a dream. 60 years later, we're the dreamers. The problem is we're facing the schemers. It's the streamers on one side, the schemers on the other. The dreamers are fighting for voting rights. The schemers are changing voter regulations in states. The dreamers are standing up for women's right to choose. The schemers are arguing whether they're going to make you stop at six weeks or 15 weeks. The dreamers are saying that if you're LGBTQ or trans, you have a right to your life. The schemers are saying, we're going to make you look like you're something that should not be tolerated in human society. It's the dreamers against the schemers. The dreamers are in Washington, D.C. The schemers are being booked in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Fulton County Jail. The dreamers will win. The dreamers will march. The dreamers will stand up. Black white, Jewish, LGBTQ. We are the dreamers. We're the children of the dream. That's Al Sharpton on the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. But let's go back to the original 1963 march and that famous speech, the one you, Gary Young, wrote a book about, the speech, the story behind Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. We chose that clip of the dream because, in fact, it wasn't going to be in this speech. Is that right? Talk about uh, his close ally, the person who was with him the night before. Uh, he was with a group of his allies talking about what he should say, the Reverend Wyatt Walker. Well, that's right. The Reverend Wyatt Walker um, had said to uh, King, because the, the dream sequence have been used in several speeches uh, previously, most uh, uh, best heard, I think, in Detroit, uh, not long before. And um, White Walker said to him, don't, don't use the dream bit. It's, you know, you've, you've, you've done it over and over again. It's hackneyed, it's, it's tired, D do something new. Um, and let's One talk thing. about this, Gary, that, I mean, you write about this so eloquently in the speech. He had just talked about it at a, addressing the, what, Insurance Association of America, and before that, a few weeks before Detroit. That's right. And, uh, so it, I think uh, before insurers in Chicago. And, um, uh, I mean, King had given a lot of speeches during that time, but you have to remember, lots of people didn't have television. Uh, and so, uh, this was his chance to speak both to America and to the world. Um, unless you're in the movement uh, or you're African-American and active in the church, you maybe probably hadn't heard him speak. So this was his chance. And he was worried that it was going to sound too hackneyed, uh, uh, too trite. That's what um, Wyatt Walker said. It's, it's trite. And so if you listen to the, to the speech, he is actually winding down. And he used to say when he was speaking, it was like uh, 
um, looking for a place to land. Like he was a pilot looking for a place to land. And you can hear him saying, go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama. He's he's looking for a place to land. And it's Mahalia Jackson, who's, uh, uh, whose voice we heard right at the beginning, who was at the Detroit March, who says, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him <laughs> about the dream. And Clarence Jones, uh, who had written the first draft uh, of the, the draft that was printed of the speech, which doesn't have the dream in it, uh, he, that he saw King in his body shift from a politician to a preacher. And he turned to the person next to him and said, these people don't know, but they're about to go to church. And then King starts on his uh, dream uh, uh, on his dream sequence, which becomes the thing that is best known about what well, is called the dream speech for a reason. And Gary Young, let's talk about another addition um, that he was warned. No, you've said this before. Don't say it again. I want to play the clip of Dr. King talking about the bad check. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Dr. Martin Luther King, 60 years ago today, talk about the bad check and how it made it into this speech, Gary. Well, he was he was uh, he was very keen that um, that there was some kind of analogy or description that would uh, uh, that would span in a way from slavery through to the 60s and make it clear um, uh, in a in a as accessible a way as possible that um, short of talking about reparations uh, which you know wouldn't wouldn't have really worked in that kind of uh, venue that America owes us. And it owes us morally, but it also owes us materially. Uh, there were some who were not keen on that kind of uh, uh, that analogy. They thought it went too far. They thought it was too crude. Um, but actually, in a, in some ways, I think it's the most. It's not the it's not the most florid piece of the speech, but it it's in some ways the most important because. It speaks to now that the, the, the check keeps bouncing. And in fact, um, um, in a way, things are going backwards. The account is getting worse. If we look at them rolling back the voting rights and uh, affirmative action uh, and so on. And one has to, to uh, think, and some of the people I spoke to for the book said this, how people would understand this differently if it was understood as the bad check speech, as the promissory note speech, um, how uh, that might shift their understanding. Because actually what happens with this speech is that all sorts of people, awful people and good people, but the awful people will take a moment from this speech and claim it, including Ron DeSantis did his anti-woke bill, he evoked Martin Luther King and the, the that one line about um, the uh, his children being judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. That's the only line 
that uh, right-wingers and Republicans know. And actually, even Ron DeSantis, even when talking about banning books that would really refer to the roots of this struggle, evokes uh, Martin Luther King, which is why I thought it was so important to write the book, because I felt that he and this speech had to be reclaimed and positioned in its in its kind of rightful space. And I wanted to make a contribution to that. And in talking about the bad check, the issue of the insufficient funds, um, it reinforces the name of the speech, the March on Washington for jobs and freedom, not just for freedom, uh, talking about the economic plight of a population that had been formerly enslaved. Um, if you can also talk about what is most misunderstood about August 28, 1963, about this gathering where, early in the morning, reporters were um, on radio and television saying, it looks like not that many people are going to come out. Um, you have the amazing organizers of this speech, A. Philip Randolph. You have Bayard Rustin. Rustin, you write about taking out um, uh, his watch and a blank piece of paper when reporters are saying, doesn't look like you're going to have anyone coming to the speech. And he said, no. And the paper was blank. What did he say? Um, we're right on we're schedule. Right on schedule. <laughs> yeah. I mean, first of all, we have to understand that a march of this size had actually never been organized before in the capital. That the um that the state assumed that there would be violence and militarized the capital uh uh to a huge, to a huge extent. And in the end, there was there was no violence. Um that, as you have pointed out, it was a march of jobs and freedom, organized jointly, civil rights movement and the uh, uh, and the labor movement, uh, class and race. I, I, an implicit, I think, understanding that to try and understand racism without class or class oppression without race is to really misunderstand them both completely. Um, so that makes it a march for, uh, as you say, for jobs and freedom. This uh, this force of energy that is Bayard Rustin, uh, this uh, gay African American man who stands at the heart of uh, the organizational excellence, really, in getting everybody into the city and out of the city, to the extent that the the minutiae went to telling people don't bring egg mayonnaise sandwiches, it's going to be a hot day, the mayonnaise will go off, it will get you sick, there are only so many toilets. That is the extent of the kind of uh, organisation uh, um, that there was. A fragile coalition, uh, which included some of the more conservative elements, and the unions were among some of the more conservative elements in some ways, and SNCC, and the, the sprightly fighting John Lewis, the late John Lewis, who, um, uh, whose speech was the subject of frantic last minute negotiations because he wanted to talk about um, the protesters marching through the South as Sherman did. You know, uh, Gary, we've got a clip of John Lewis speaking at the march. He was the youngest speaker. He was 23 years old. Um, this is John Lewis. Oh, we are be patient and wait. We want our freedom, and we want it now, John Lewis said, at the age of 23, a leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC. Uh, he originally wrote for this speech, as you were talking, Gary, about these frantic negotiations for forcing him to rewrite his speech. He originally wrote, we cannot depend on any political party, for both the Democrats and the Republicans have betrayed the basic principles of the Declaration of Independence. We will march through the South, through the the heart of Dick.
galaxy the way Sherman did. We shall pursue our own scorched earth policy and burn Jim Crow to the ground nonviolently. Take it from there, Gary. Well, you see the energy of what will soon become the Black Power movement. You see the negotiations with uh, uh, a more religious, uh, uh, an older generation and the union movement. In the end, it's A. Philip Randolph who says, I've been waiting for this moment because A. Philip Randolph sought to organize a, a march on Washington, I think in 1943, certainly during the war, uh, it may have been 42, but it was in order to ensure that black people could um, work in the munitions factories. And he only called it off when uh, Roosevelt relented and um, uh, issued an executive order. And he said to um, uh, John Lewis, I've been wait, young man, I've been waiting for this time <laughs> kind of all of my life. Please, please uh, do this for me. And um, uh, and Lewis relents. But then also that energy from Lewis also kind of tells a story about what happened during that year. Because at the beginning of that year, only Randolph and Ruston really wanted a march. The, um, uh, the NAACP, the Urban League, uh, all of those, they didn't really want anything to do with it. And actually, SNCC, uh, the SNCC crowd thought it would be like a big show, a march in Washington, whereas they wanted to march on Washington. And it's really the events at, in Birmingham, Alabama, earlier in the year, which force the leadership. This comes from the grassroots. It forces the leadership to say, well, now we have to have a march. We have to do something. And in the story of that year is the leaders literally, well, figuratively running to catch up with the base, which on the day they literally do because they're in, they go to meet Congress, um, the people in Congress, and the march starts without them. And they have to kind of run to catch up. And the picture that there is, um, which looks like they're leading the march, actually they're near the front, but they're not at the front. They just clear people to make it look, uh, look as though it was. And there's an interesting moment where um, King and Randolph and uh, and um, others, for James Foreman uh, from CORE, they are in uh, uh, speaking to Kennedy just a week or so before the march, and Kennedy's trying to get them to call it off. And Randolph says, uh, he says, we we want we want legislation on the hill, not a big show, not uh, Negroes in the streets. And Randolph says, the Negroes are already on the streets, Mr. President, and I doubt if we called them that they would get off. And that gives you a really clear, clear indication of who was really driving this and what was really driving it. 